Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 228, Date Night, Board Games for Couples, brought to you by our new sponsor, Grand Gamers Guild. I'm Sean, and here with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, helping you make your game nights better. We're here live on Twitch Wednesday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern, and you should stop by and join us with our fantastic lobbyists in the chat. So one of the most popular topics we've ever covered here at Tabletop Bellhop is two-player games for date nights. With Valentine's Day 2024 right around the corner, I thought it'd be a good time to revisit the topic, especially since Deanna and I have discovered a ton of new two-player games that we love since the last time we covered this topic. Now, in fitting with this theme, we'll be reviewing The Cupid Crisis from our sponsor, Grand Gamers Guild, and Distilled, a game my wife and I first played on a date night and which we still love at two players. We wrap up talking about the games we've been playing, including our first thoughts on Disney Lorcana and the art project and more. You can find a list of links to games and most things we talk about in our show notes, which you can find at tabletopbellhop.com slash episode 228. That's 228. Links there may be affiliate links and games mentioned may have been provided by publishers for review purposes. Let's start off with a trip to the suggestion box. Welcome to this week's suggestion box. Here we share some of the feedback we've gotten over the last few weeks. Up first, a cool comment on our Mystery of Hunter's Lodge unboxing. Bonnie Burton writes, I was a writer on the Mystery of Hunter's Lodge game. It was such an honor for me to work on it. I've been reading Agatha Christie books since I was a kid, so this Hunt a Killer game is near and dear to my heart. Hope you like it. See, that's pretty awesome. So congratulations, Bonnie, on getting to work on something that was so dear to you. Now, our next comment comes from Celius, who commented on Sean's article about Supers RPGs he was reading at the time. They write, Masks and Marvel heroic role-playing are my favorites too, along with Truth and Justice. It's a PDQ game and a great addition to any super genre. Oh yeah, and Atomic Robo, if that counts as a superhero game. Well, I don't know about Atomic Robo, I haven't checked that one out yet, but just this afternoon I added Truth and Justice to my collection. Unfortunately, I have been very lax in reading new games, so while it's there, the fact that it's digital only may slow down when it gets read. Now up next, a comment on our Artemis Project unboxing from Dan Angevine. They commented to say Grand Gamers Guild has changed it, so they only have a single skew for it now. The metal used to come in little baggies, like each token was its own bag. It was overkill. And they've held up well, I'd say better than my Dino Island coins with the enamel. This game is a treat. It's easily on the table. And yeah, the art totally grabbed me on the original Kickstarter. I uh, note we published this and got the comment before Mark signed up as a sponsor. I got to say, this is some good to know info here, especially on the SKUs. Um, I'm glad that got cleaned up because it was a bit of a mess. I did, when I did the unboxing video, I wasn't even sure quite which version I was unboxing. And it's also worth noting in my copy, you can see it in the unboxing, the metal badges were in these like long strips folded between foam paper that was kind of rolled up. So you kind of unfolded one layer at a time and not individually bagged. Now, I found that a little odd, but I got to say that's much less wasteful than one bag per batch. Well, let's go with one more. Three Hammer commented on our Disney Sorcerer's Arena Epic Alliances review to ask, what's your favorite expansion? Uh, so far, it's the one uh, that, that, that Three Hammer just watched at the ready. Um, while I love the other two and I love the fact they added something new to the game, and I really dug the new things, the, the rules for water terrain and the rules for um, token creatures. I thought they were really neat. It just felt like they needed to do more with it than just have it be like a special thing for one character only. Like you don't use the water if you don't use Moana and you don't use the tokens unless you use the Horn King. Until more characters are released with additional companions or additional tokens or we see other train types or even more so characters that can use the stuff that's already out, like someone else that uses water tiles, I think you're better off with at the ready. It's just more of the base game, more options and some really fun characters. Now, what about you? Do you have a favorite? Oh, well, I did love at the ready. I think the water mechanics in turning the tide really stand out. Even if it did mean we were sad to see that not every expansion had new rules after it. And there were other, there are other characters who can use the water tiles, just not lay them out. Yes. All the oceans. Yeah. The water tiles them. affect everyone. Well, that's it for all. That's all for this week. Thank you to everyone who comments, shares, and interacts with our stuff. Well, we've got an earlier-than-usual heads-up about an upcoming show cancellation. 
Yeah, it's always good when we can announce these things ahead of time. So here's your early warning that we will not be recording a podcast on Wednesday, February the 7th. Yeah, I'm going to be out of town for the day job and uh, will not be able to go live with Mo. Now, that doesn't mean I won't go live on my own that night. Um, any night Sean can't be here is actually a great opportunity for me to unbox some games. And you know, I've always got stuff here to unbox. There's quite the pile still behind me. You can kind of see on top of the Calax there. I will be sure to let you know, though, if that's the plan when we get closer to the date. We're here to answer your gaming and game night questions. Tonight, we're tackling a combination of questions that have come from a variety of people, including best two-player games, best two-player board games, best board games for couples, two-player board games for couples, best two-person board games, best two-player board games for adults, best games for two people, board games for couples, date night games, and more. Yes, because by far the most popular question we get asked is some variety of this and the most popular content we produce has been about good two-player board games in particular talking date night games that has been the most popular thing on our blog for the entire year well this even beats out the gloomhaven faq video that for some reason is still getting <laughs> regular views yeah that one baffles me where we, we should we should do a frosthaven one even though we'd never even played the game and just see if that takes off as well so with Valentine's Day right around the corner, combined with the fact it has been quite a while since we've actually talked about two-player games for couples on the podcast, I decided now was probably a good time to do a follow-up and let you know about some of the best games my wife and I currently like to play on our date nights. We wanted to make sure we had something current and up-to-date that not only featured some more modern games, but also highlighted games that you can go out and pick up right now. We know we're not always about the new hotness, and our lists have at times featured hard-to-find games, so we're trying to avoid that this time. Now, before we get to a list of games, let's start by talking a bit about picking the best games for date night. So the big thing you really want to watch for when grabbing a game to bring out a date night is how much room it takes and how long the game takes to play. You want a game that doesn't take up too much table space, especially if you're planning on playing at a restaurant. Restaurant tables are often cluttered to start with, even before your food comes. And if you plan on snacking while you play, those drinks and apps still take up room. And then length is important if you're planning on playing either while waiting for food or drinks to alive, arrive, sorry, or heading out to a venue where they want to rotate the tables off. While pubs are generally pretty great about you spending hours there, as long as you keep buying drinks, your favorite dinner spot probably would rather you get in, eat, and get out. Another thing to consider... Something near and dear to my heart due to my day job is lighting. Games with high contrast, large text, and clear iconography are often better for date night. This is especially true if you don't know exactly what your plans are. Places tend to like to dim the, light, the night, uh, lights as the night gets later, and those high contrast components are going to let you keep playing even when this happens. Now, the last concern I want to bring up, and last consideration, I guess, would be dis when deciding what games to grab is uh, volume and communication. Look at how much communication is needed to play the games you're thinking of bringing. Now, this could matter both ways, uh, both because you don't want to be too loud in some quaint or romantic settings, or because it can be hard to play a game that requires a lot of talking and communication when the live band starts up at the bar. Now, all of this pertains to date night where you're going out of the house, out to a restaurant, pub, cafe, bar, winery, etc., a public place. There's nothing wrong with a night at home or even planning to play some games at home after you get back from a night out. The advantage of playing at home is you shouldn't have any of these limits. So now that you know what to watch for when picking games for date nights, we're going to move on to some games that fit these criteria. Now, because date nights vary and different people are looking for different experiences, we've broken this list into a number of different sections based on where you may be going and what you may be doing. Now, just a note, this is a family rated show. So while there are a wealth of adult-oriented board games of various quality out there that may help with certain types of date night, that's not what we're covering here. Now we're going to start with quick games that don't take up much room. These games should fit on small coffee tables or a small standing bar table and can be played in between 10 and 20 minutes. So this is where Shobu fits in. This is a chess-like abstract strategy game that doesn't need much space at all. All you've got is four wooden boards with five by five grids on them and 40 stones, two in different in two different colors. 
This is an abstract strategy game where you're trying to knock all of your opponent's stones off one of those boards through a series of passive, then aggressive moves that match. Now, if you want more info on Shobu, just check out our review. Now, you may need to watch out if one or both of you have a real competitive streak, as that may not be the tone you want to set for your date night. But for simple components that fit anywhere for fast play, it's hard to beat this one. Even spilled drinks aren't going to ruin your fun here. Stones don't care. Though, I'm not sure how machine washable the rope is. Yeah, and the rope's kind of an option. That's probably a piece I would leave at home anyway, because all it does is remind you, you can, your first move has to be on your side. Next up, a game that kind of is a good follow-up to this is Boop. This is a board game about cats jumping on a bed. This takes up even less space than Shobu, as there's only one central board, which is a bed, which features actually a quilted playing area. Each turn, players are going to put kittens onto the bed, and these kittens boop away other kittens they're placed next to. Get three kittens in a row to upgrade them to cat. Cats can boop cats and kittens, but can't be booped by kittens. Get three cats in a row to win. Now, we've reviewed this one as well, if you want to learn more. Now, I thought we were doing adult games. Cats and <laughs> beds and anyway. While still competitive, the darn cuteness of this game really takes the edge off that. And it's not as stain resistant for play anywhere as Shobu is, but it's still small and quick. Just beware that you might get others peeking over into your date night fun just to see what the adorable game is. Now, Drop It has become one of my favorite dexterity games of all time, and more importantly to this topic, it's one of the few dexterity games my wife enjoys. Drop It is all about dropping different geometric shapes into a vertical tray Tetris style. It has surprising depth due to the fact that your drop pieces only score if it's not touching anything the same color or same shape. Points are scored on how high the piece sits and if it touches bonus circles. And yep, we've reviewed this one too. While certainly compact and resilient, one thing uh, to think about is arm length. If you're the sort that sit across from each other, will you both be able to reach the game easily for both seeing and dropping your pieces sitting on either side of a table? Sitting on a, at a table corner, uh, you know, 90 degrees from each other might make for easier play. Now, another dexterity game that's great for date night would be Catch the Moon. This is a game where players are trying to reach the moon by building a precarious stack of ladders. It features a plastic base and a variety of different shaped birchwood ladders. Each turn, players roll a die, then place a ladder so it's touching one or two other ladders, or ends up being the highest point. As an added bonus for date night, this one can be played competitively or cooperatively. It's also great with up to four players as well. No review for this one yet, but we have will have one coming soon. Now, do watch out for the die on this one. It's not loud, but you wouldn't want it to go skittering off. The pieces aren't super sturdy, but that's not something I'd be worried about on a quiet date night. The co-op is tough, but it's a nice option for the date. Now, I grew up playing Racco, and my wife and I rediscovered the game on one of our Kingsville staycations. Since Racco then, Racco has become one of our favorite date night games, especially when that date night involves some adult beverages. It's light and fast enough that you can play while just hanging out and chatting. Learn more about this classic through our review. Now, this is one of those slightly of a step beyond standard card games. You can't play it with a normal poker deck, but it's as easy as can be to pick up. And if you're unable to count numbers for some reason, that date might have other problems. Now, another game we discovered at the same spot is Sushi Go. Now, Sean's gone on about this one quite a bit. It was our first time playing it. It's a quick playing card drafting game that doesn't require much table space at all, especially at two players. You get a hand of sushi cards, pick one to keep, and then pass the rest on. Cards you keep become a tableau and score points at the end of the game with each different type of sushi having its own scoring system. Well, I haven't tried it two player. I've spoken at length about how much I love Sushi Go. It's just quick easy and fun well next up we have games with medium game time but still not taking up much room you're gonna have a hard time fitting them in before a meal arrives though they aren't long enough that you have to feel guilty about staying too long while finishing up your drinks so i'm putting point salad at the top of this list because its game length can range from quick to medium now, you, one round of point salad, we could toss this up in the last group of games, but when playing two players, the suggested way to play is to actually play the game three times in a row so you go through the entire deck of cards and total your scores. Now, you can play that one quickly. A full two-player game does make it a little longer. Now, this is a drafting game where each round you're either going to take two veggies off the table or a point card, and at the end of the game, you're going to compare the point cards you drafted to the veggies you have and score your points. 
Now, while we haven't tried it yet, AEG also released Point City, which is supposed to be just a bit heavier, which I got to say sounds really good to me. Now, if you do want to know more about Point Salad, you can check out our review. Honestly, unless you hate lighter, fun games with a passion, this one is working up. For two all the way up to six players, you're just not going to regret having this one in your back pocket. Now, The Duke is a two-player abstract chess-like game that we still play regularly on date nights. Like chess, you're trying to capture one of your opponent's pieces, with the neat thing being the pieces show how they move right on them, and after you make a move, you flip over the tile that may reveal new moves. Now, we have brought up the Duke quite a bit, and it was also on our last date night list, but since then, the game has been re-released in a new version called the Duke Lord's Legacy, which is what you can find now. This is the exact same game. It comes with everything that was in the Duke with a new improved box, slightly clarified rule book, the Arthurian Legends expansion, and five brand new tiles, which I'm jealous of because I don't have those. Our love of this Duke predates this whole tabletop bellhop thing, so no review to share on this one. We've been playing it too long. I love playing this one with anyone, and while similar to Jess, I think you'll find it quicker and more approachable. A two-hour or more chess match might be perfect intellectually for you, but the restaurant might want you gone long before then. Now, while not exactly quick, it's certainly faster than most heavy chess games between skilled players, while still giving you some of that feel. The random tile bag pulls might be the only thing that turns off hardcore chess players. Zensu is another abstract strategy game. Zensu is a shogi-like game instead of a chess-like game, because shogi is basically the Japanese version of test. This game literally puts easy to learn, hard to master on the box, which I, I got to say is, is a bit brave because that's what people like to say about most abstract strategy games. I like the Duke. This features pieces that show you how they move right on them, but no flipping them over this time. Instead, this is a perfect information game about getting one of your pieces to the opposite side of the board before your opponent does the same to you. Now, my wife and I are still discovering Zensu, and you can look forward to a full review later in the year. I'm tempted to call this the checkers version of the Duke because you know everything from move one and because of it, games will be fast. Now, I'm not sure about the 10 minutes that they list on Board Game Geek, but maybe once it becomes second nature to you. See, it might be that short because I know when we tried it, Deanna fit in a full game with um, a, a, one of the, the, the people at Origins did a full game with her in, in a demo and I was standing watching. I don't think it took that long. So I think this one this one can be quick. So well, maybe it's one of those games where the more you know the game, the longer it gets, because then you're out playing and outmaneuvering each other. All right. Well, next up, we go the opposite way with games that are quick to play, but take up some room. You won't need a full table, but they probably aren't going to fail on one of those round coffee shop tables. These work well when there are only two of you at a four seater. Katara is a folk on a map area majority game with an Afro fantasy theme. It's one of the few games of this genre I've found works really well with only two players. The game even includes a special smaller two-player board with less spaces on the map that physically takes up less space. Players will draft cards that determine how many units they get and how many actions they get with those units. Now, combat in this game is deterministic. The larger army pushes the smaller out. Units are never killed. They just have to retreat. Now, a bonus for this one is you can end up be able to find this one pretty cheap. It's shown up in a lot of discount outlets. Now, this was a hidden gem game, and the smaller board means you could even package up a special two-player version for easier carrying on date night. Now, sometime, somehow, I looked back before, before doing this and looked at our last time we talked about date night games. And I'm like, what the heck? How is this not on the list? We didn't have Lost Cities on there. Now, Lost Cities is a two-player-only card game that I used to play with my wife when we were actually dating, so I'm not sure how we missed it. A local coffee shop downtown had a copy. I would meet Deanna for lunch, and we would often play a round or two of Lost Cities. Now, for those that don't know it, this is an older one. I think most people have heard of it. This is a fantastic hand management pusher luck card counting game from Rainier Nitzia. Note, this is Lost Cities, not Lost Cities Rivals, which may sound like the two-player only version, but it's not. And that's all I'm going to say about it. Lost Cities is a classic from a master of designing games next i have dice kingdoms of valeria it's a roll and write standalone game in the valeria universe players roll dice and activate their citizens similar to how resource generation works in valeria card kingdoms the active player then selects one of the dice to use to take an action the value on that die showing how powerful the action is you can explore the map battle monsters hire new citizens build monuments and more while the game works with up to five players it's particularly quick and tight with just two 
It also doesn't need a lot of room, especially if you just use the game box for your dice roll. This is another one you can check out our review for more info. Tear off a few sheets, throw some dice in the cards in a baggie, and you're good to go. You can even get printable versions of the sheets online. Greet with crayons at your favorite Roadhouse-style restaurant. Now next we get to the middle of the pack. These games require a bit of room and a bit more time to play. Best for a coffee shop or a slow night at your favorite restaurant where they don't mind you taking up a table for a couple of hours between playing and eating. Kapow is a hero versus villain battling game that features customizable dice. Each player has an asymmetric player board and a starting set of dice that are used to attack, defend, and upgrade your hero. Upgrades let you gain additional dice or more faces for the customizable dice. Now, there's two versions of this, Volume 1 and 2. They're both identical, except they feature different characters. You can expect a review of both volumes from us soon. We just need to try the game at four-player, but my wife and I do dig playing this one. So this one does have randomness. Uh, you're rolling dice, and that's really what you want to take away from this. It's light and competitive, but not aggressively so due to the random nature of it. You know, and take, take that for what it is and what your tastes may be. Next, I have Star Realms Frontiers. Now, I did call out Star Realms many times in the show, and I did call it out in our previous date night topics. But I want to call it a specific newer version. That is Star Realms Frontiers because it includes something I think that is perfect for date night play, and that is cooperative play. Now, my wife and I still adore Star Realms, and our love for this game was reignited when we found Frontiers. Uh, you can find out exactly why in our Star Realms Frontiers review for the full story on that one. Well, while every couple is different, I really prefer co-ops for this sort of night. We can have enough conflict in our daily lives, and often date night is to escape that. A nice co-op is a wonderful way to have that shared bond with someone. The sci-fi theme and fantastic combo system of this one is just an extra bonus for me. Sticking with cooperative games, we've got Illiterati. This is a word-building game that I like to think of as Bananagrams for hobby gamers. Now, I'm calling it out here mainly because we had Bananagrams on the last list, and, and I still stand by that. It's still a good two-player game. The problem is, though, when your skill at word games is unbalanced between your couple, that's what Illiterati fixes. In Illiterati, players are rogue librarians trying to save the world's books from the evil Illiterati, which is a fantastic theme. Now, my wife is really good at word games, and that usually means that it's no fun for me to play against her. With Illiterati, though, her skill just means our team does better together. The word game for couples who hate playing Scrabble. I think a lot of couples have this imbalance, and this levels the playing field as well, lets you not only make words, but use some of your knowledge as well with some of the requirements, balancing spelling knowledge from one player and knowledge of some other, some possibly obscure topic like names of tech companies uh, yep. for the other player. That leads me to Dolce. Uh, which I didn't know the term for this until just end of last year. I learned people are calling these bingo games. That's where you have uh, one input and everyone uses the same input. You end up with a different output. This is an engine building game about building a confectionery empire. Every round, everyone has to decide what to do with the same building. They can build the building, they can flip it and use it to plant ingredients, or they can discard it in order to produce ingredients and hopefully produce some desserts. While many people have called this multiplayer solitaire, and I think rightly so, they're not wrong, that's actually what makes this work great with two players. This is one where you want to have good light. If you're playing yeah. this in a very atmospheric location, you might struggle with some of the symbols. I know I did in good light. Yeah, that's a good call. I hadn't thought of that one when putting that on the list. Uh, next, I have a game that is brand new for us that I just got for Christmas, and that is Disney Lorcana. This is a Magic the Gathering style two player dueling card game featuring characters from all over the Disney universe. Now, it's a bit less confrontational than most collectible card games, with players racing to be the first to get the 20 lore. Now, the downfall here is, of course, the entire collectible aspect, but we've been having a great time just battling with the preset starter decks with each other. Now, we'll be sharing more thoughts on Lurkana later in the show. So pick up a couple of starter boxes and just play. Maybe you'll get into the collecting, maybe not, but the starter decks are all you need for a night of fun play. Two boxes give you everything you need, including starter guide, playmat, and tokens. Now here are some games that need a good sized table. They either have central boards or require a larger playing area for each player. 
These are too big for most restaurants, but do work at some pubs and cafes with larger tables that aren't overly busy. So one of our strongest recommendations for two-player games, and every time I talk about two-player games, I like to bring up Race for the Galaxy. It's still one of my favorite two-player games of all time. But now I want to follow that up with a new recommendation, and that is for Terraforming Mars Ares Expedition. This is the game you get if Terraforming Mars and Race for the Galaxy had a baby. It features a much smaller map of Mars, an action selection system that's almost identical to Race for the Galaxy, but still features all the tableau building goodness from Terraforming Mars. And it plays in about an hour, which makes it a much better date night game than either of the originals. Notably smaller than Terraforming Mars, but with so much of what you love from that original, minus some of the length. Still not a quick game, but it's shorter than many, if not all, games of the original. Now, one thing to note is that there's somewhat less player interaction in this version, which is good for this list, but might turn off some people who love their hate drafting. Next up, I have Disney Sorcerer's Arena Epic Alliances. This is a two-player card-driven skirmish war game that lets you battle your favorite Disney and Pixar characters. Each player builds a team of three characters, each of which has its own deck of cards. Mash those together and take the battle to the arena using some of the best-looking standees I've seen in a game. Despite the Disney theme, this is a very solid tactical and strategic skirmish game that is both approachable enough for new players and deep enough for hobby wargamers. All of that with no miniatures to assemble or paint, thank you. So far, we've reviewed everything that's been published for this game, and every review has been positive. The only thing I would say uh, for this is, if you're a collector of it, it's a lot to carry around. You might want to pre-draft and just bring what you need in one box, rather than trying mm -hmm. to bring the whole collection. Sadly, there are no first-party solutions to store this game and its expansions. Now, for this section, I saved the Castles of Burgundy for the very end, because when you first pick up this game, like many Steffenfeld games, it can take you a long time to play, especially when learning the game. That said, once you and your partner know the game and you no longer have to look up what specific building tiles mean in the rulebook, it can play very quickly and very smoothly. Even better, there are now multiple printings of this game, including a super deluxe edition. But whatever version you choose, The Castles of Burgundy is still, in my opinion, one of the best two-player games ever published. Space and good lighting are your friend on this one. Playing it in person means you lose the ability to get mouse-over information like you do on Board Game Arena. Now that leaves us with the final part of our list tonight, the Chunky Games. This final list of games are the ones that you're probably going to save for a stay-at-home date night. Perhaps something you return to after a nice dinner out, or something to play after dinner at home. Now, personally, my wife and I like to pair these with some homemade charcuterie and craft beer. That said, I've actually played two of these games at a coffee shop. One that didn't mind us spending the afternoon and putting some tables together. Also be aware that the first three games mentioned here are on the heavier side, and aren't going to be everyone's idea of date night fun. Not everyone is like Deanna, who enjoys some brain burn with her board games. These are generally going to be for your date nights at home, or when you get home after dinner and, and take the time. So Tapestry is one of my wife's favorite games, and it plays surprisingly well with only two players. You can play this anachronistic civ building game as a head-to-head -head battle, or if you want to make things even more interesting, you can toss in one of the Atoma which makes the game actually more cutthroat. Now, I will admit, I do prefer this game with more players, but I love the fact that if it's just Deanna and I, we can sit down to play one of our favorite games. This is another one you can learn more about if through our tapestry review. The dripping asymmetry of this one is certainly a huge bonus. This game is probably the most controversial game that we talk about in general. But people either love it or hate it. And honestly, I think both sides have some solid and justified arguments. This is the first step down a path of multiplayer solitaire, as it does feature a little area control map combat, but very little. Now, the hot game in our house right now is a huge box you can see behind me, and that is Marrakesh. That is from Queen Game Stefan Feld City Collection. It's actually the first brand new game in the series. This is a very component heavy Euro game that's for longtime Feld fans and experienced gamers. Please don't make this your first Feld. Despite the fact we have played this on a date night, had a coffee shop, and tried to set it up upstairs at a brewery, you're probably better off playing this one at home. 
even if it's only due to the fact there are so many tiny little components, uh, gates and caches and tokens, and there are no spares. I, I fully admit, this game is not going to be for everyone, but this is a list of the date night games my wife and I enjoy. This is a beautifully juicy point salad with a ton going on, but only a limited option tree, which helps keep the game manageable. If you're considering leaving the house for this one or have a smaller gaming table, what you could pick up is the Essential Edition. While you didn't get all the cool bits, it does take up less space. Personally, I'm happy having the big one. This one is hefty in more ways than one. I would say that unless you are both familiar and confident in your knowledge of this game, don't bother. But if you already love the game, then the lack of direct competition, aside from some drafting, makes it great fun for a couple. Next, I have the hybrid deck building and worker placement game of Lost Ruins of Arnak. This is a favorite in our house and has been since we first picked it up. We love playing this at all player counts, but noticed it's particularly engaging and cutthroat at just two. There's a real rush to try to buy the good cards or advance up the temple track or defeat the right monster or explore the perfect area before your partner can beat you to it and get that thing they really want. The thing is, in Arnak, there are so many different packs to victory that getting cut off in one direction doesn't ruin your chances of winning in any way. There's always another probably equally valid option available. This is another one. You can check out our review for more info. When you're both using the same board and drawing from the same market, it's really very much each player playing their own game, which could be a bonus or a negative depending on who you are and what you're looking for. What you're getting either way, though, is a great midweight game. Now, the last game on my list today is Hero Quest, and I'm putting it here because it's a game my wife and I played through when we were dating. I took on the role of the evil Zargon, and my wife played all four of the characters. We played through the entire campaign as our relationship grew, so this game will always hold a special place in my heart. Now, we haven't called out Hero Quest in the past because the game was out of print for years, lost in the world of red tape and copyright. This has since changed. Hasbro, through their Pulse crowdfunding thing, has published a brand new version of Hero Quest, which features the same gameplay but updated artwork and components. In addition, this is the part that is most impressive, they continue to put out more content from the game. And now there's more available for Hero Quest than there ever was before. Maybe you too can cement a relationship through shared dungeoneering battles with your partner. Stranger things have certainly made for lasting relationships, and no one gets hurt but the orcs and demons. So there you have it. An updated list of great games for two-player date nights covering a wide range of time, space, and player skill requirements. Is there something on the list we missed? A game you and your partner just love to share together when out? Let us know in the comments or join us at discord.tabletopbellhop.com and chat with the community. And now a word from our shiny new sponsor, Grand Gamers Guild. So in the next segment, we're going to be reviewing The Cupid Crisis, the fourth game in the highly acclaimed holiday hijinks series, which has a Valentine's theme, and it would also make a great date night game. But there's another holiday that hits before then. Punxsutawney Phil needs you. On a cold February morning, you find yourself trapped in the professor's manor, faced with the results of his experiments with time itself. Can you break the loop and escape? It's time to get your groundhog on. The Groundhog Gambit, that is. The Groundhog Gambit is the seventh holiday hijinks game. And no, you don't have to play them in any order. They're all standalone games. It packs a full two-part, two-hour escape room experience into just 18 cards. That's double the length of all the other games in the series so far. You can pick it up as a single game, a print and play, or part of a bundle at grandgamersguild, all one word, dot com. And don't forget to use our exclusive code BELLHOP, B-E-L-L-H-O-P, to save 10% off any order you place through Grand Gamers Guild. Tonight's episode is about date night and the upcoming Valentine's Day holiday. And now I welcome you to join us for a review of The Cupid Crisis, the fourth holiday hijinks game. Like all the holiday hijinks games, this small box 18 card escape room was designed by Jonathan Schaefer. It's published by Grand Gamers Guild, who we welcome this year as a tabletop bellhop sponsor. The Cupid Crisis is a 60-minute mystery for one or more sleuths of any age. It has the highest difficulty of the Holiday Hijinks games, with a rating of 3 out of 3. Now, each Holiday Hijinks game is a standalone game, and despite being the fourth game in the series, it's not the fourth we played or reviewed. 
Check out our previous reviews of The Kringle Caper, The Independence Incident, The Birthday Burglary, and The Turkey Trial. All of these games have a few things in common. They're all low-priced, small card packs that contain only 18 cards that work with a browser-based, device-independent web app, and each is themed on a different North American holiday. So the Cupid Crisis is, of course, based on Valentine's Day and has you arriving at a restaurant to meet your date when things go horribly wrong. While the story is written from a single-player perspective, you could play this game with any number of players. The puzzles in the Cupid Crisis are very modular, and you are presented with more than one to work on at once, which is perfect for splitting up the work between two or more players. Due to the escape room nature of this game, we didn't do an unboxing video as we don't want to spoil any of the puzzles. We can assure you, though, that the component quality here is great. The card designs are clear and functional, and the puzzles come in a variety of types. Many of the puzzles here expect you to write on the cards. While you can do that, we suggest you use some penny sleeves and, we, and wet erase markers or tracing paper. That way you can pass the resealable pack on to another group when you're done. Yeah, in this particular case, the copy we were playing had obviously been played before, which is pretty cool. Now, to play the Cupid Crisis, you open up the card pack and follow the instructions inside, which are basically going to have you put the deck of cards aside without looking at them and open up the web app on your phone, PC, laptop, TV, whatever. There, you're going to select the proper game because they're all listed at once and hit play. The app will then give you a brief introduction and have you flip over the first card. This card presents you with a puzzle, with the first puzzle, and an odd twist for the series, an answer for that puzzle. Sort of. The answer is entered into the app, which then continues the story and has you draw a bunch more cards. For each magnifying glass you find on these cards, you'll have to answer an answer in the app, leading you to draw more cards until you get to the end. Now, if you get stuck, the web app includes some standard puzzle-based information, things like the NATO alphabet and flag codes, and specific to this particular game, famous love stories. There's also a graduated hint system that gives you hints on a st one step at a time, leading up to the final solution to each puzzle if you get really stuck. Now, we ended up using more hints in this game than any of the others we played. Eventually, you'll get to the final puzzle, enter the answer, and are given a score out of five, and the option to send your play info to Grand Gamers Guild so they can use it to help balance and rate future games in the series. Now, this was the fifth holiday hijinks game we played, and the first that Deanna and I tried on our own. With the Valentine's Day theme, we thought it'd be appropriate to try this one with just the two of us, without the kids this time. Not that you can't share a holiday about relationships with your kids, but it makes for a nice break as well for a family that normally games together and maybe doesn't always get the time to just let the grown-ups play games together. Plus, the story here is very Valentine's date night story and not one of handing out cute paper messages to your friends. Now, the Cupid Crisis worked pretty well, two players. And that's what, what I was hoping for from this one. Right from the start, you're presented with multiple different puzzles to work on, and each of these leads to a new puzzle and a sort of branching path. Each individual puzzle can be solved by one person, but it's nice to have someone else there to help. Some puzzles we were able to solve on our own, while others we swapped back and forth, and a couple took both of us puzzling through it together, which just felt about right. As with any puzzle game, having someone who can view things differently from you is often all it takes to crack something you've been spinning your wheels over. And actually, in the end, due to the way we split up the tax, there were actually some puzzles I never even saw and some Deanna didn't see. We solved them on our own, entered our answers in the app, drew the next cards, and went on to the next puzzle. Perhaps a bit less date night sharing than some might want, but a totally valid way to work through a sol the solution. Yeah, it's actually the first one I'm like, I could play this again because I could try the other puzzles. Now, the Cupid Crisis does have the highest rated difficulty of all the holiday hijinks games we played, and I can see why. We used more hints here than we ever have before and got totally and completely stuck on the final puzzle. Now, early in the game, there was one puzzle that we needed two hints for. One, the first hint's always like, you need these cards, right? So we had that. That was fine. But the second one actually gave us a clue what to do with those cards, and we didn't end up using that. Now, I'm sure one of us may have figured this out at some point. But our playtime would have been much longer and our score probably much lower. The final puzzle, though, we had to use three steps of hints before figuring out what the game wanted us to do. We probably spent 20 or 25 minutes of our one hour playtime just on that one puzzle. And that's a big jump from previous puzzles. Have you even used more than one hint on any 
puzzle before? I think all we've ever used was the make sure you need, like, here's the three cards that are relevant right now, or, you know, you have to use all the cards. We've never gone on to find out what we had to do with the cards before. This is the first time. And we had to do that basically for two puzzles. Now, overall, though, the puzzles we did solve on our own and together did give us that whole, you know, makes you feel smart thing, which is what you want from one of these kind of games. And I would say the overall experience was very solid. While there were a few times, I think we could have used more players. Maybe we wouldn't have gotten stuck with another set of eyes. I do think this ended up being a solid date night game for us. And that's certainly a great way to play it. Though I don't think there would be anything wrong with sharing it with the whole family either. What'll be interesting now is maybe I'll let the kids play through it on their own and see how they do, which is something we haven't gotten to done with the previous copies because we've all played together. Now, of all the holiday hijinks games we played, the Cupid Crisis felt the most like the two of us were actually trapped in an actual escape room, wandering around, trying various puzzles and looking at each other for help when needed, and then eventually even calling on the staff for a hint when stuck. Escape room in a deck, you might say. There you go. Mark's going to start putting that on all the all the packaging now. Now, if you're looking for a fun way to spend an hour or so with your significant other or your family on or around Valentine's Day, the Cupid Crisis is a good choice. While we played this one at home, I could also see playing this out at a coffee shop, winery, craft brewery, perhaps even at a restaurant. But if you do do that and decide to play out, make sure you pack some paper to take notes and some card sleeves and markers so you don't have to write on the cards. There you have our thoughts on the Cupid Crisis the fifth game in the Holiday Hijinks series of games from our show sponsor, Grand Gamers Guild. We're going to be back next week with the final game currently released in the series, The Groundhog Gambit, so be sure to watch for that. Now, what I love most about these games is how much punch they pack for being only 18 different cards and how different each game in the series feels. Now, you can pick up a copy of The Cupid Crisis as a standalone game, as a print-and-play, or part of a bundle at grandgamersguild.com. Use our exclusive discount code BELLHOP, B-E-L-L-H-O-P, to save 10% off your order. Now, is there a series of games that keeps impressing you the more content that's released for it? Something that every time you try out a new one, you're like, damn, they got to be out of ideas by now. How do they keep coming out with these games? I would love to hear about that game in the comments. Or better yet, jump on the Tabletop Bellhop Discord and share your thoughts there. If you aren't a member yet, you can find it at discord.tabletopbellhop.com. Welcome to our review of Distilled, a game about crafting spirits from a brand new publisher, Paverson Games, who we have to thank for letting us take a review copy, Home from Origins 2023. Distilled was designed by Dave Beck and features solo play by David Digby. Artwork is by Eric Evanson and is the first game published by Paverson Games. It's originally funded on Kickstarter and is currently up for pre-order on Paverson's website. This booze-making board game has proven to be very popular and is being localized to a number of different countries by various different publishers. There are currently nine different versions of the game out there from eight <laughs> other publishers. Yeah, congratulations, Dave. Uh, Distilled plays one to five players and plays very well at all player counts. Now, Board Game Geek lists this as best at three, and I'm not sure I agree with this, unless you're just trying to get in a quick game during lunch or something like that. We found it plays just as good with five. The game length is very player count and AP dependent, which could be where the three-player rating comes from. Two-player yeah. games take less than an hour, but our five-player one was almost three. Now, Distilled is a board game about making spirits in a distillery. Each player has recently inherited a distillery along with its signature spirit recipe. Each round, they'll hit the market shopping for distillery upgrades, ingredients, new recipes, and useful items like barrels and bottles. Once everyone has gone shopping, it's now time to brew the booze using a uniquely thematic push-your-luck system. Players then choose to sell or age their beers, brews, sorry, not beers, brews, <laughs> before their spirits. Players then choose to sell or age their spirits before moving on to the next round. Player with the highest reputation will be awarded the title of Master Distiller. For a look at the components and the excellent game trays inserts that come with this spirited board game, check out our distilled unboxing video on YouTube. Now, the component quality here feels really top of the line. This feels like a deluxe super edition of the game, and we don't even have the cool upgrades like metal coins and metal recipe cubes. The game still feels deluxe and elegant. The game tray holders for the labels, money, and cubes work great. Though the card holder at the bottom of the box only really works if you keep the game stored flat. 
The rule book matches the component quality being extremely clear, and there are detailed reference cards for all players. Next up, we're going to get into an overview of play for Distilled. While Distilled Miss mechanics are tied well into the theme, and the game has a great flow to it, there's a lot going on, more than we want to cover in this review, yeah. so please don't consider this a full rules teach. Now, the first choice you have when setting up a game of Distilled is which tasting board to use. There are six options here, and we quickly learn they make it quite a big impact on how the game plays. Now, not in the rules for the game. The rules are always the same, but what strategies are going to work and which are going to be favored and which combos are going to work best? Now, all players do use the same tasting board. This is a decision that's made as a group. Once you choose a tasting board, you can set up the majority of the game following the rulebook, including filling the shelf board with labels that match your chosen tasting board. Watch for things that are based on your player count, like the mm -hmm. number of labels and the number of spirit awards. Next, each player chooses a color and takes their own personal distillery board and recipe clipboard. They're then dealt three distillery goals and two distiller identities. Each player is going to choose one of these identities to keep and then grabs the signature recipe, signature ingredient, and starting resources that are listed on that card. Each identity also has a game-breaking asymmetric special ability. Each identity comes from a different region called their home region. There are three of these, Asia, North America, and Europe. The spirits on the recipe card also each come from their own region, though show, some show a home symbol. The region for these is your identity's home region. Now, the game is played over seven rounds, each of which has two phases. You start with a market phase, then you go to a distill phase. In the market phase, players use their money to buy things. These include unlocking new recipes on their recipe board, basic ingredients, which are always available to all players, buying premium ingredients and items that come from a randomized central market, which is uh, refreshed as cards are bought, and distillery upgrades, which unlock more game-breaking bonuses. Now, a big thing to remember here is you can only buy two ingredients from the basic market each turn. This market represents a brewer's co-op with limited supplies and resources. Ingredients come in a variety of forms, yeasts, waters, and sugars. Sugars themselves come in three types, grain, plant, and fruit sugars. The simple form of these are available in the basic ingredient market, but players will want to buy more expensive versions to distill better spirits. Now, items include bottles to place your spirits in, your finished spirits, and barrels to age your spirits. Most bottles have regions on them, just like the spirits, and will give you extra points if you bottle a matching spirit in the proper bottle. In addition, players do score end game points for their bottle collection, which is also region based. The most important thing everyone should be aware of during the market phase is that they need to have the ingredients to distill something every turn. Different recipes score different amounts of points and money, but the basic thing you need every turn is one yeast, one water, and one sugar. More advanced recipes may require multiple sugars of the same type, can't have certain types of sugars, or require a specific type of vessel to age. As the game progresses, leftover alcohol can be reused in recipes in place of yeast or water. Which leads us to the distilling phase. Here, players simultaneously decide what ingredients to distill and make a washback deck out of that. There's a section of the board to kind of split up your cards to make sure you have a viable brew. This deck, again, must have one sugar, one water, and at least one yeast. Every sugar you have in your deck, you're going to add one alcohol card. You're then going to shuffle it all up and remove the top and bottom cards, returning them to your pantry to be reused in later turns. You then decide what barrel to put this brew in. Now, you do start with a basic metal barrel, but you can also use ones that were bought during the market phase. Everyone then determines what they brewed by referencing their flight card. No matter what, as long as you have the basic ingredients to brew, you will end up with either moonshine, a spirit with no sugars in it, or vodka, a spirit with any mix of sugars. You will take the label for whatever you brewed and place it on top of your barrel. Then in player order, players have the option to sell what they have brewed. Most spirits have to be sold on the turn they were made, but others require aging. They have to go into special barrels and are placed into the warehouse spot on your board, where they're going to start accumulating flavor cards for each round they're stored. When selling, players pick a bottle to use, which can include the basic starter bottle all players get or something they previously purchased. Players collect points and cash based on their mix, as shown on the recipe card, as well as what cards made up the final batch. Premium ingredients provide more points and money than the basic ones. 
Now, aged spirits can also be sold at this time, as long as they've been aged at least one round. And the process is the same, except you get bonus points based on how many flavors the spirit has picked up. The more flavors, the better. Individual flavor cards will also affect the value of your finished spirit. For each spirit sold, you'll unlock a bonus by placing the label onto the top of your player board. These bonuses let you get things like ingredients, items, and upgrades for free, claim some extra cash, search through the truck, which is the market discard, for cards, or unlock your signature ingredient for use at any point during the game. This is a powerful tool, and why distilling something every turn is vital. Now, signature recipes and ingredients are unique to each brewer identity and tend to be worth a lot of points and money. They're generally harder to brew than most of the other spirits in the game and require your signature ingredient to be in the final match. Thankfully, these have a special ability where if you remove them during distilling, you can put them back in. But that won't help you if you pull out another required sugar. If you use your secret ingredient and your batch fails, it's gone for good. While all of this is going on, players also need to watch their identities, upgrades, and the modifications on cards, as these can all break the rules. In addition, players need to watch for chances to score the Spirit Awards put in play at the start of the game. Now, each of these provides a first-come, first-served set of bonus points that players can claim during the round if they meet the criteria on the reward. Things like brew a batch with uh, six sugars in it, or have eight alcohol in your final brew, or have your warehouse full of aging barrels, or brew spirits from all three regions, and so on. If more than one player claims one of these in the same round, everyone gets the points. That part's friendly. But once they're claimed, no one can get them in future rounds. The game continues swapping between market phases and distilling phases, round after round, with the start player rotating and the market clearing a bit between phases. After the third round, players will choose one of their gold cards to discard, saving the other two for endgame scoring. Then, after the end of the seventh round, there is some final scoring to take care of. Here, players are going to get points for any spirits still aging in their warehouse, but you do lose out on that flavor bonus, their completed bottle collection, points awarded by their distillery upgrades, distiller gold cards, and if they have, oh, sorry, gold cards they've accomplished, and any leftover money. The player with the most points becomes the master distiller, and in a cute bit of marketing gets an actual cardboard award, they encourage you to hold up and take a pic and share on Facebook and or Instagram. Now, all of that sounds pretty overwhelming. There's a lot going on in Distilled. But, uh, and I know it's a cliche uh, for anyone teaching a game to say this, but it's way worse sounding than it actually is in play. The key to this is something we've talked about in the past, and that's how important it is and how well it works that the mechanics integrate with the theme here. This covers almost all aspects of the game as well, including the fact that you have a recipe that holds your flight menu, the general market represents a distiller's co-op, and probably most notably, the way the during the distilling phase that you remove the top and bottom card from your deck. This directly relates to how actual distilleries remove the head and tail of their wash during the distilling process. Now, because of this theme integration, distilled is pretty easy to teach, and I've also found the rules easy to remember even if I go a month or two between games. Now, the box does include a first taste book that is great for onboarding new players, as it makes a lot of the initial decisions for you and walks you through the first few rounds of a game. But honestly, except for my first learning game, I've never felt the need to use this to show the game off to gamers, and even gamers with minor hobby game experience. While I certainly have experience with heavier games, this really was utterly simple to pick up, and the reference cards, unlike some, only add to the ease of play. Often we might question something, and before Mo could find it in the rules, someone would note it off one side or the other of the reference card. Yeah, they really are good. Distilled is just a, a very elegant game. It looks great, the theme matches the gameplay, and this has a flow to it that just feels good at the table. And that covers all phases. Well, yeah, there's sometimes some AP during the market phase. Things still go around the table pretty quickly, and honestly, when there is some IP, sometimes I've appreciated the extra thinking time myself. And then the fact that the distill phase is mostly done simultaneously makes that part of the game flow nice and quick. This leads to a surprisingly fast game. As with most games, the more familiar you are with the cards, in particular the various distillery upgrades, the faster you'll be able to play, as you won't need to pause and read the available cards. And you'll be able to think up strategies further in advance with the knowledge of what's likely to come up. Now, the thing is, quick here doesn't mean simple, easier light. 
Distilled is an engine building game where you start off with just basic ingredients and knowledge of simple recipes. You're going to build on that over time, learning new brews, upgrading your equipment, and collecting more expensive and rare ingredients. The thing is, you can never get everything you want. Yes, it's one of those games where money is tight, leaving you with hard decisions phase after phase, round after round. Indeed, while you may be able to think of the strategies faster, that doesn't mean they'll be an optimal as with other players drafting from the same market and a limited number of labels available, making the wrong mash at the wrong time can be disastrous. Now, what's fascinating to me is that this brutal resource management and having to plan out things turns in advance is combined with a push your luck element. Every distill phase, you're taking a chance. That is unless you go really overboard on ingredients and make sure no matter what cards you remove, you get the brew you want. But by doing that, you're going to limit yourself in other areas. Those ingredients come at the cost of upgrades or bottles or a variety of recipes. While it can be worth it sometimes, because there's nothing worse than losing your signature ingredient when failing to make your signature spirit. But pulling that off with just enough sugars can be one of the most rewarding experiences. Financial management is vital in this game, as enough money means better ingredients, which means a better outcome from the still and even more high quality ingredients and so on as your engine builds. But make a mistake, brew something with no labels left, left and you've suddenly lost a major advantage that could mean you're out of the running. Well, not every batch of spirits is perfect and there are a few things I think could be improved in this game. Now I'm gonna call this one out, I didn't have a problem with it, but my wife did not like the onboarding system presented by the first taste guide. Um, she doesn't like any time the game tells you or people tell you what cards to play. Like here's your starting hand and on your first turn, you're gonna take this action and you're gonna play this card and you're gonna buy this. If you have someone like that in your group, you're best to just um, like go through the tasting guide, but just kind of set it up as a mock play and walk through it yourself. And then once you've gotten through those first two turns, just wipe it and start fresh. On the other hand, we do encourage games to provide this sort of onboarding experience for less advanced yep. players. So I really don't think that having it is a drawback at all. You just need to know who to use it for. Yeah, I totally agree. Now, next up, despite my uh, the, the love I shared during the unboxing video for the box insert, um, the, the top part's fine. I absolutely adore the, the, the money, the tasting cubes, the labels. Those all work great. Uh, though finding one specific secret ingredient, special ingredient, signature, that's where signature ingredient is, is a little annoying, but they're great. The problem is the bottom part, the card part that is divided up the whole cards. For one, they didn't tell you what to put where, which, come on, give me a sheet. Give me something that tells me what to put where. You can easily find it online. And you can come up with your own solution. But second is it looks like it holds everything in place. And I even did the thing where you put the, you know, the cardboard insert under it so it's nice and tight. Even with that, if not held perfectly flat, some of the cards are going to shift. Like this happened when I brought it from my basement to upstairs one day. Now, when I pack this game up or put it in my Calax standing up behind me, it does bad things. Um, anytime I brought this out to public play events, when it's been stored vertically, I've had to spend a good five, 10 minutes or more sorting cards before we can play. Indeed. While the insert looked fantastic, it was utterly useless in keeping the game materials separated and organized. And this wasn't shaken around or thrown in a trunk the last time. So now the other potential issue here is, of course, going to be the randomness in the game, because the teach and the theme and the overview of play and the initial play really makes this feel like a perfect open information heavy euro, like something like a splatter game, right? If it has that feel to it, but then you get to the distilling phase and there's that random push your luck element, right? Which, yes, it can be avoided, but it's there. Well, this is a fantastic catch-up mechanic. I, I love the fact that, like Sean mentioned earlier, if you mess up a batch, you can then kind of shoot for the moon and try to brew some really good stuff with less ingredients. And if you get away for it with it, that tends to get you back into the race. I, it's, you can do it, but that whole randomness is going to turn some players off. Well, others will revel in the ways to minimize that randomness by stacking your wash with the right ingredients to pull off a triumphant batch of high-quality hooch only to have to stick it in a plastic bottle because they couldn't afford a nice one after buying all their ingredients. Yep. <laughs> yes. Yeah. There's definitely a give and take there that I actually like. I, honestly, overall, I, I like everything about still pretty much like, like I, the only reason I, I'm nitpicking is because I feel like I don't want to be overly pie. I got to say something bad about the game, right? Um, I love the still really. This is one of the best games in my collection at this point. And I have a large collection of games. 
I adore how well the theme integrates with the mechanics and how easy to pick up this game is and how easy to teach it is. As someone who runs public play events, having a game that's so well integrated and so easy to pick up is fantastic. Like as a perfect example, this is one of my youngest daughter's favorite games, and she's the one with multiple learning disabilities. The way things are presented and distilled just made sense to her. And even in her first play, she was challenging the point leaders right to the end of the game. Now, while I'm not a drinker and many games on the theme of brewing and vineyards just haven't done much for me, I really found this game sang and not only made sense, but felt thematic. If mm. there was one aspect I might call out as slightly pasted on, it's the global regions, which yeah. while important for end game scoring and label names, just felt a bit too generic and were even minimized on the board in how small they appear on everything, making them rather hard to see and differentiate at a distance. There you go there. If we're going to call out one big problem with this still, there'd be a little problem. Hey, chronography is a little small in all cases. Uh, we've complained about this a lot. And I, I got to say those ones in particular are very hard to tell apart depending on the lighting you're under. I, I have to agree with Sean on that one. The regional symbols could have been way bigger or just give me a big capital A, E, or something, or nor N. N for North America, A for Asia, E for Europe, and big letters. I, I, I would like to see that, actually. So, yeah, that's, that's a good point. Now, the other thing I do like about this is how big a game it is while still playing in what I would consider a short, manageable time frame, especially at the low player counts. I can't think of many other games in my collection that pack this level of strategic brain burning punch in about an hour with three or less players. Like I get that feel of an epic challenging game night in a nice short burst. I was equally surprised with how we managed to fit a five player game on a smaller dining room table. Now it took a bit of planning, but it worked and everyone had space for everything. Now, the game can benefit from a bit more space and it is important to try and make sure players, especially newer ones can see and easily read the market. I think anyone who enjoys engine building games, especially those that enjoy games that reward long-term planning, being presented with a set of restrictions and goals and being able to form a strategy from them are going to light distilled. That's one of my favorite parts. When you start off and you look at that tasting board and you get your brewer and you decide which brewer to play and you're, you already are starting to think out your future turns going, okay, I'm going to make this and I'm going to make this. I really love that. Though, be aware, if you don't like randomness, this is going to be part of the game. But that randomness, I actually think, is part of the highlight, and that's what's going to make this game appeal to fans of lighter games, combined with that ease of picking up and the rule gameplay. You basically getting, like, I think it's going to appeal to a wide range of gamers from the slaughter crowd to the medium Euro fans. And while I don't deny the randomness, you're, you're shuffling a deck and pulling out cards, there are so many aspects to help mitigate it. Yeah. There are no dice being rolled here. These are just stacks of cards with ways in the game to cycle and check the decks, as well as overloading your wash to minimize the risk of loss. It's yeah. not perfect information, but I'm not sure it would feel all right if it were. Now, while there is a science to distilling, there's also an art to it as well. Yeah, yet another way the game is thematic. Honestly, I'm having a hard time thinking of groups that probably won't enjoy this one at all. Sure, the theme may be wholly unappealing. If you are never interested in playing a game about alcohol, I all the power to you, I fully understand. But as for mechanics, I think there's something here for a wide variety of game groups. Despite its depth, the game can be played pretty casually. So I guess I'm saying unless you like only like dexterity games and party games, try to find a way to play distilled. And one note about the theme is this isn't at all about drinking. No, uh, there's no drinking that takes part in this uh, in this game at all. It's purely about the manufacture of spirits. So there you have our thoughts on Distilled, one of the best new game discoveries we made in 2023. Mm -hmm. A great example of a game that is made better by its theme and which showcases how design mechanics around the theme can make even more complicated games sing. Thank you for joining us for this review. While some spirits may be in order, if you did enjoy this segment, I invite you to tip your bell hops by buying us a coffee. You can do so at coffee.com, that's K-O hyphen F-I dot com slash tabletop bellhop. While I can't promise I won't add some Irish cream to it, I can say we will be grateful. And now in the bellhops tabletop, we look back at the games we played since last episode. 
So there's a bunch to cover here. So there was the holiday is and New Year's Eve and a couple of game nights and a bunch of stuff going on. So we got quite a bit to cover here. I'm going to start with uh, Endangered. This, uh, we had our first couple plays of this, uh, played it first time with Brenda with both kids. Um, we were using the Tiger mission when we tried that. And then um, we played a second game with uh, just one of the kids with three players, tried it again because, well, we failed badly the first time. But then we knew what we were doing and we won the second time. And then we played once again on New Year's Eve where Sean joined in and we tried and successfully saved the otters. So I figure, why don't we just talk about the game in general instead of breaking this up play by play by play? I mean, it had otters. I, I'm not going to complain. <laughs> There's no <laughs> way I was missing out on this game. So I, well, the funny part about that one was I had no idea there were otters in that game at all. Like the cover of the box is the tiger and I knew there were tigers. And I knew there were like other expansions and stuff. Like I have a Monarch Butterfly expansion. I had no clue the other side was otters. I'm like, man, if I had known about that, I, I would have begged Mark for that game a long time ago, I think. So as for the game, it's a cooperative dice placement game with asymmetric characters. And I got to say an interesting mix of mechanics. Um, there's a board out and it's just basically a grid with your chosen species out. Um, you're going to take turns rolling your dice and putting them on various action spots on the board. Very quickly in the game, one of the spots lets you play more cards. And when you play cards, most of those cards are new spots where more people can go, which is actually kind of cool. Other actions are going to let you move the animals around, remove devastation, earn money, and so on. Now, every round, it's one of those co-op games where a player takes a turn, then the board does nasty things to you. It's like that. Um, you take your turn, then bad things happen. You're going to put devastation tiles out um, using kind of a coordinate system. And then you're going to draw from a species specific deck. Now, all of this is true for all different animals, all versions. And the main game comes with tigers and otters. Now, the goal, though, in every game is to actually convince various countries around the world to vote yes for measures that will protect the various species. And you have to try to do that before two things happen. Either your species dies off. Uh, if you're left with zero or only one left, so there's no mating pairs, you can never have more more of that species, or you run out of time, because if there's enough time, it just assumes this species, the their habitat is destroyed if you run out of time, or if you run out of those devastation tiles, it just, the area is irrecoverable. So those are your ways you can lose. And I got to say, I like the system. I really like the way... You start off with a limited number of worker placement spots and you're kind of fighting for spots with the other players. Though so it's cooperative. It's like there's a lot of strategy on when to play where. But I love the fact that you're putting more out almost every turn. There's going to be new places to put things. And I think that's neat. And then the placing worker system, I actually thought was really neat because you get this interesting that uses what, what they like to call popcorn initiative from role playing games. Where when you're done your turn, you pick who goes next. And because of the fact that, like, when a player goes, they collect their dice back, you might have someone go first because they have a bunch of sixes out and they're taking up room. Or you might have them go first to get a card out before you go. And it leads to some really interesting cooperation. Uh, this is this game is, is really interesting, both in mechanically, but also just in uh, the sheer range of uh, official species and how different they are. Uh, if that is also a bit sad because there are that many species that need saving from human activity. Yeah. Um, there are also a significant number of player made uh, mm -hmm. expansions for this game as well as the official ones. So, yeah, we've, we've got more to explore. Uh, the next one I might try is the Monarch Butterfly, which is, is more of a promo, a small package expansion. We're going to try that. And uh, behind me, you can just actually just see it there at the top of the shelf is the expansion with, I think, Four or seven, six, no, it was like species. seven, wasn't it? Or was seven, that well, one of them's together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's two, two, like, and like one. one of them is two species at once, which I think are eating each other. One's eating the other, which which could be interesting. And I got to say that the two species did play very different. Mm -hmm. uh, this is one that it's going to take a few more plays before we review it, but not much. Like we've already got, I played it four times already. So I'd yeah. like to get in a game with Sean to try the tigers, and um, then we'll we'll get that review out. And then I say I'll probably throw the butterflies in for the fifth game. Because I don't think I'll need a full five plays with a, 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 a promo pack before we can talk about it. The only thing I'm interested in is uh, whether or not uh, the new species uh, changes the nation cards at all. Because that yeah. that seems to be the weakness of the game is that they're a little on the expected and similar. Like, the, yes, if those aren't changing, 
while the rest of the game is changing, those goals are still rather similar between each game. And and that might be the drawback of the game, uh, despite all the really cool stuff that's happening on the board. Um, if, if the yeah, countries are just kind of the same, the same goals, every game that could wear. Yeah. That was one of those, our first learning game we didn't know, but by our second game, we were already new. Uh, the green ones are going to be roll some dice and add your influence and try to get to a total. The country ones are going to be add up something on the board state to your cubes. See if you get a total. The last one, the gray one does seem the most varied. That one seems the most interesting, but yeah, it would be nice to get some more country cubes or more country cards. Sorry, not cubes. Yeah, so it'll be interesting to see what happens when we do open up that box. Because uh, yeah. again, that's uh, of the of what we have right now. That's the limitation of the game. Um, definitely not yeah. the, the board states. Now, another game that got played more than once over the last couple of weeks was Monstrosity, but specifically using the Robots expansion. Now, I just published the unboxing for this one early this week, and if you saw it, you got to see my utter surprise in discovering a variant way to play. I was way too happy about that. Actually, I still am happy about it, but I was like just shocked. I really thought I was going to do a one minute unboxing and look, it's 50 new cards. We're done. And here I open it up and there is a variant, a new way to play the game called some assembly required. Now I'm going to save the full details on how to, um, how to play through this probably for next week, maybe the week after reviews ready to go whenever. But what it basically involves is instead of one person drawing a monster the whole time, you set a timer and you're going to have to pass your monster around to other artists. So you draw a part, pass, drop another part, pass, draw another part, pass. So everyone's working together to draw the monster. For me, other than timer management, which gets harder with this variant, yeah, uh, I think it's absolutely 100% improvement to the base game. I would recommend and prefer Ask possibly to play it in this version uh, every time. Yeah. No, honestly, this is this is my new favorite way to play Monstrosity. Even if I'm going to play the base game with the standard monsters, I am going to play using the Sum Assembly required variant. Because the big thing it does is it reduces the impact of artist skill. Now, you can check out our Monstrosity review where I already talk about how this game isn't about drawing great. It's about getting a message across and trying to draw things abstractly to get shapes and, and, and that. But this even makes it even less important how well an individual player can draw. Because everyone's working on the same drawing. Plus, you get this whole, I don't know, it's more of a group experience. It just feels better overall. Like you're not worrying about if you won. It's 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 more of a score for everyone together. Like you almost want to throw the scoring out with this version. It's interesting. Uh, what I noticed was there were times when you really had to look at the number on your drawing board because the what came back to you didn't look like anything you had started with. Um, <laughs> yes. You you maybe had started off on the wrong thing, or the or the person describing it had really kind of filled in some some major details that you hadn't clued into first off yep. and so when it comes back to you and even though you started it you have no recognition of you know yeah, it's, yeah technically that's my board <laughs> but that's you know it's just the surface that's mine and what also i thought was interesting is you have to change how you describe things as the witness as well and it's kind of mentioned in the rules it's like you're going to want to describe different parts of the robot at different times instead of trying to get the whole thing at once because everyone only has 30 seconds to add also, I, I do want to note that one of the reasons we picked up robots, this is on the no review copy here. We bought this one at Origins. Um, I mainly bought it because my kids found some of the original art in the original game a little creepy. Um, like I said, when I'm, during the review, my youngest actually had nightmares after the first time playing it. This is a much more family, younger kids, phobia friendly version. Um, the robots are pretty much cute for the most part. Uh, some of them look a little like cartoony transform -y, but there's no not nothing scary at all. So I got to say, describing some of these robots can be hard. I, I noticed um, again, it's been a while since I've played it. You've, you've played it a few times with the family and stuff, but I haven't played yeah. it for a couple of months, probably. And it's interesting to see how differently we all now describe mm -hmm. the cards, having become more expert at playing it. Uh, yes. Things like whether or not you should turn your board landscape versus portrait um, mm -hmm. placement on the the thing, you know, and, and, you know, things front back, not visible, visible coming around from behind all these little details of positioning that really help the artist yeah. uh, as opposed to, uh, you know, the, the first time people play, they often start talking in color when you're drawing yep. with black markers. Um, mm -hmm. So there's definitely an advantage that comes 
with playing this game, not necessarily advantage, but a change in yes. in how you describe things. Yeah, I always find it amusing because Gwen has totally changed up hers. She'll literally tell you what to draw. She'll be like, first, you're going to draw a square around the middle of your board, and then you're going to add arms to the outside that look like this. And I'm like, wow, it seems to work pretty well. And, and even with that like amount of detail, it's still everyone ends up completely different. So it's not like it's like breaking the rules in any way. Nope. Yep. All right. Another one that had multiple plays is Block and Key from Canadian company Inside Up Games. Um, I can't remember how much I described this one in the past. So I'm going to go with the fact you already know what I'm talking about if you listen to our previous episodes. And I'm just going to say I'm still really digging this one. Um, this was a big hit with Gwen. Now, my youngest, though, did have a hard time with this. Um, she's the one with various learning disabilities. She had a hard time with the spatial nature of this game, which honestly isn't surprising. So she was one and done. She tried it, said, OK, it's kind of neat, but I'm done. Brenda, though, loved it. Um, Brenda was the one who was like, even though one of the kids quit playing, was like, can we play again three player? So we had to set up the board slightly different to play at three player. Um, I, I, this one, like I knew it would be good. Like I, I wouldn't have taken a copy home from origins. This one is a review copy that I requested at origins. Um, I wouldn't have brought it home if I didn't think we'd enjoy it, but it's better than I thought. Like, like it's, it's significantly more interesting and more fascinating. What I have found now that we've gotten more plays in is people are now positioning things to be nasty. So while you could put the cube up nice and close to you. So it makes the perfect pattern. It's even better if you can put it way far away from you in the front of the other person's blocks to make that new pattern for you. And I've got to say that's changing the feel of the game. Yeah, it's a solid game. Um, now, I will stand by my thought that they were a bit too cute with some of their art and yeah. the rule explanation of the rules and things like that. Uh, and even the game board is, is kind of meh, um, didn't really achieve what I think they were going for. But the game is really solid and it's, you know, it is a fun, difficult game uh, with a lot of different ways. You know, as you said, you know, things are becoming more cutthroat now that you, as you exp yeah. uh, explore it now. And I think the game has a ton of potential because of that. Uh, next up was the art project. I think I should be saying the ART project, but I'm not going to do that every time. Uh, this is one of the latest games from the op and their big attempt to get more into the hobby gaming market and get away from their, we make family games reputation. Um, first game was Sean, Deanna, and I. Um, this one, we actually got to see a preview of. This is one of the most beautiful games in my collection. Some really striking art. It's uh, Vincent Dutrait, who a lot of people love their artwork already. Um, this, I found the artwork fits in really well with the theme of the game. And while that theme is the players are a ragtag bunch of people traveling in an old Volkswagen van, to various countries trying to recover stolen artwork from an evil group called the White Hand. And this is done through a mix of very cooperative, coordinated, lots of talking and communication card play, very light resource management and very tight resource management, only three resources, but man, trying to um, figure out what to use and where, um, tied with a, a surprisingly random dice-driven combat system. Yeah, I I think striking and beautiful is something that many people have said about this game. It's one of the the big selling points. Is it's when you when people walk by walking by it on the table, uh, it's just gorgeous. Uh, to the point where they even sent you you know you even get a uh, beautiful postcard with it uh, and a yep. poster, which unfortunately is horribly creased just to <laughs> yeah. um, for for fantastic art, but uh, horrible creases. Um, yes. But yeah, no they. The gorgeous game, unfortunately, it is very co-op, which is going to turn some people off who aren't who aren't going to yeah. want that. So, yeah, so far, positive thoughts. Um, we've played three times all on the base map. Every game has been close with one win. Um, looking forward to trying the other maps. And that's another thing. we uh, uh, The amount of replayability here. What do you get? I think it's six maps, six maps yeah. which, is, which is a lot like like honestly, that first japan map could have been a whole game like i probably wouldn't have complained i don't know what the price point is maybe the price point i'd be like no nah, i need more maps but like man two maps like six maps is ridiculous now the thing is in this game is there is a lot of coordination required and quarterbacking is huge like i don't even think i want to say it can be huge i, I originally in the notes i have can be no i think it is just huge now with the right group i can honestly see this becoming one of my favorite co-ops 
And while even to show for it, we all know how much Deanna doesn't like co-ops, she'd actually rather play this than most co-ops we own. So uh, $42 is the MFRP on this one. Yeah, uh, I might want, want more than one map. Yeah, so I Still, think one, for six? Yeah, for six is definitely small. Yeah, it's... it's uh, this game so much more than any uh, because of its open discussions because there's it's it's fully open information really um, not yep. perfectly really open but pretty close. Well, there um, are literally no restrictions. You're just not allowed to show your the opponent your yeah. other players your cards. That's you can it. talk about everything in your cards. You just can't show them the cards. Yes. Um. And 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 that really pushes you towards that cover. Uh. The quarterbacking. I mean, the, with the three of us we've all played enough games that we're all knowledgeable enough to be able to contribute more or less equally. Yeah. But if you stick a new player into a group of experienced players, it's really easy. Uh, you know, it's hard not to railroad it's or run them not. over yes. because you know, what's going to work. I mean, it's, it's, you know, you, you've short of them having the perfect card that they aren't able to tell anyone about, you know, you're able to work things out pretty clearly and, and, that can be a major drawback in some groups. Yeah. Yeah. So this one, I, I think more than any is going to be uh, the group dependent. Like I, there are some people are going to hate it. My youngest daughter hated it. Like absolutely. It, it, I could tell she wanted to quit partway through the first game. She does not like games where other people tell her what to do. So, so she absolutely did not enjoy it at all. Now I do have to give them props though, for the design of the cards. Because this is one of the first times I've seen this where the card backs have significant, important information on them. And it's honestly, it's the one of the main things you want to talk about as a group. So instead of having to go, do you have any of this? Do you have that? You can easily look around the table to see what clues different players have because you're trying to make sets of three clues while managing your resources and doing everything else. So I, I do have to give them props for that. Deanna is calling that out in the chat right now as well. And it's interesting because that actually, one of the things we didn't notice in, immediately when we started and picked it up halfway through our first game was that is face up information on the deck as you're dealing out the hand each yes. round. And so you're actually discussing the gameplay as you're dealing each round out, which is something that is, I don't think I, I can't think of any games where, where that's, you know, where you're actually sort of not, you know, discussing and playing during that dealing phase. Yeah, now I've seen games where there's information on the back of the cards that tells you, you know, what type it is. Um, the, uh, we definitely saw it in um, the, the movie-making game. Mm. It's in the movie-making game where where the um, the bad things are about to happen deck, and we've talked about it, like, well, you could do this, but you know the next one's going to be a set thing, but it's definitely not common. Yeah, well, and it's also that, you know, that's just, a, it's going to come up. It's not a matter of, okay, you need to get this card because we're going to do this, yeah. and you need, you know, that that sort of thing came out in this game. Uh, the other new to us game, there were a lot of new to us games last week that tends to happen around the holidays, but honestly, these weren't all Christmas gifts or anything. It just, we had time to game and we actually all game together. Uh, the other big one is Guild Academies of Valeria. Uh, this is proving to be very popular with everyone I played it with. Um, I originally played two player with Deanna. Um, didn't make our date night list, but you know what? It's solid. Like we, we had a good time playing it. It could have been in there with Marrakesh and whatever. Um, then a three player game with Sean and now we've only played twice. Um, I think that's right. Maybe we're on three. I can't remember if Deanna and I played twice before Sean played now. See, it's, it's, uh, it's the holidays. It's kind of like quarantine, but like less deadly. Um, I am digging this game. This is solid. Um, I like the theme you are, you are playing retired adventurers. Um, it kind of, kind of gives you the, the hint that, um, you played all the other Valeria games. Now you're retiring, which I thought was kind of amusing. And as part of your retirement, we are decided to um, focus on our legacy, right? So you're going to start up a, a school, an academy, and pass your knowledge on to the next generation, which I thought was a neat theme. Uh, this is done with a dice drafting system where dice represent the students. And yes, they're customized dice with special colors, but really they're just dice number one to six in the four guild colors. You're going to draft students and take actions. Actions include hiring professors, building classrooms, building up the town around your school, and influencing local magistrates for in-game bonuses and end-game scoring. Then, once everyone's done drafting things and getting students, you're then going to simultaneously send your students to class. You're assigning dice and professors to each classroom, which is going to upgrade your dice. When a die hits seven, it graduates, and you send it on a quest. I, honestly, it's it's a solid midweight euro, possibly mid to heavy. There's, there's some there's some brain burn here. 
and honestly, a great addition to the Valeria series, in my opinion. Yeah, this one stood out over and above Castellan's for me. Uh, but then, I, to be fair, I had also expected it might when I first saw the Kickstarter. We discussed this way back uh, yep. on a brunch episode, and I was really interested from the moment I first saw it. And it didn't disappoint. It's, it's a very solid uh, game that I really enjoyed playing. Yep. See, for me, I'm I'm torn between this and Castellan's, but I like area majority games. I always have. And this is this is more of an engine builder, and I, I like engine builders too. But like those, to, to me, those are still two of two of the best. Though though I'm still I, I I still will always have a a love for Card Kingdoms. I don't think that'll ever go away for Valeria games. And as we we should point out more clearly, all of these are standalone games. They just have to be set in the same world. Now, I remember last episode, I said I wanted to include more classic games in our game nights. Well, New Year's Eve, I broke out a my not so shiny, but my new to me copy of Dixit that I picked up when we were both up north um, at my uncle's place. And I found it for a, at a flea market for a buck. So um, I, I, Dixit's been a been, I've been a fan for a long time. I don't like a lot of party games. This is one I did enjoy. Um, never owned my own copy, though. Friends and family and other people have had it. And honestly, like playing Dixit, it had been, well, probably more than five years. Just reminded me how smart it is. Like, like just the designer, just like it's one of those, oh, what did I think of that kind of things? It's just such a simple system, but with interesting and whimsical gameplay. Now, the one thing I am a little worried about is I'm worried my used copy, my dollar copy may not have been complete. Um, it did have all the meeples and it did have all the uh, the dials which I do have to give props. Uh, when I played Dixit before, they had a silly system for picking which card you pick. Now it uses like a hidden dial and it works great. But I was just a little concerned because I'm like, why did um, we, go, we got through the market deck a little too quickly, I felt. So I checked. Um, it should be 84 cards, which would be 14 rounds at six players. And I don't feel like we went 14 rounds before we shuffled. Uh, I, but I don't remember because yeah. I know I mean, well, it was at the end of the game. We didn't. You know, it was right near the end when we reshuffled, but I don't remember uh, how many cards we had. I didn't. Uh, yeah. So it, it's. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, like, I know there's a million expansions, right? Yeah, yeah. And that that was Sean's main complaint on the game was it was a ton of fun the first time you got to see the cards for the first time. Once you'd seen them all, it was not quite as fun. Now, overall, it was a big hit. Um, my kids had never played it before. Deanna's extended family. Um, so, so I was glad to see Dixit still stands the test of time, I guess, as the, the case may be. Um, both kids have already asked to borrow the game to bring to school and to play with their friends. So Dixit still a hit after all these years. I mean, the art on this version that we were playing was fantastic. Uh, and it lent itself to so much, uh, varied interpretation. Like you really could use the card for a bunch of different things. Yeah. Um, and unlike Ven. Um, then just kind of led to confusion, whereas <laughs> Dixit, uh, you know, you wanted to interpret, you didn't want to stare at it and go where, what kind of drugs were involved here? Yep. So. Fair enough. They have a similar type of cards. Next time we'll swap the cards for the two games and then try that. <laughs> now, one of the other things we did do, um, this was on new year's Eve specifically, not that that matters is I did let Sean try Marvel dice throne. This was my second time playing Sean's first. Uh, we played out an epic two player Thor versus Loki battle. And what I thought was enjoyable about this is I was totally crushing as Thor at the beginning, but then Loki just kept creeping closer and doing a little bit of damage, a little bit of damage. And then all of a sudden denying pretty much every damage done to him. And, uh, I, I Loki ended up winning with, I think I had, you had three health left or something like that. Something like that. Uh, what seemed initially like an unbalanced matchup and uh, one of your daughters was like, oh, yeah, this is just like, see, they aren't they're, they're unbalanced. They shouldn't be played against yep. each other. But really, it was a difference in uh, character development and the card draws. Mm -hmm. uh, this game is going to be random. It's called Dice Throne. It's going to be random. Yep. But understanding of each character is, as often the case, a super huge benefit. Yeah. So knowing, uh, you know, where to apply your powers can be a huge differentiator. Once I started making sure that I blocked the right powers from you. Yeah, I yeah. can't block everything. You're going to be able to do something. But if I can do block the ones that are going to make the biggest difference, that, you know, that's going to allow me to ramp up the engine and, and smack you with whatever I can. 
Yeah, and I've got to say the other thing, too, is now having tried two different characters and played against the other ones, there is a, a ridiculous asymmetry here and learning curve. Um, learning to play each character is going to take some time. Um, something we're going to mention in a bit about another game is definitely true in this one as well. Now, we still have to play this a bit more, um, and but I can't help compare this to Kapow from Wise Wizard Games. This is uh, Dice Thrones from the Op. Thanks for the review copy. And uh, Kapow is from Wise Wizard. Thank them for the, the review copy. But I can't help compare these games. And I don't know if the companies are now groaning because we're doing this or cheering us for doing this. They're very similar in the fact that you are rolling dice and you are placing them on a superhero's play mat to have powers go off. What do you think about the two? Like, which is the one you prefer at this point? So sadly, the components in Kapow left a bad taste in my mouth. Um, and, and in part because of that, Dice Throne felt more solid, more professional, yeah. and really put it ahead of Kapow. And it's probably not fair to compare them in that in that professional way because again it there's marvel money and then there's you know independent <laughs> independent superhero uh money yeah. but it, it you know regardless of the characters like i i honestly couldn't care less about Mar about loki and thor uh but the components and and the use of them and things just felt more put together and thought out in mm -hmm. dice throne i i, I still have made a decision Kapow is definitely a bit more of a gamer's game, I, though I don't always like using that term. There's there's more strategy and engine building and, and more going into it and more long term planning, whereas Dice Throne's more of a dice trucker. It's it's more of a it's Yahtzee with superheroes, right? Except you're picking powers. But that's not to say it's light. It's just way lighter. And I don't know. I don't I don't know. I, I definitely like if I was going to pick one to go play right now, it'd be Dice Throne because the mood I'm in. But if I was more feeling like playing a Euro, I'd probably grab Kapow. But you know what? What I think we need to do is plan a game night where we play both on the same night and see which, I, I don't know. You don't have to pick a winner, right? Mm -hmm. I, maybe it'll be like Boop and Shobu, right? I, yeah. I, I own one for one purpose and one for the other. But what you do need to do is try them four pl players. I haven't done that with either yet. So I, that that's on the to-do list next is play both of those games for players. Yeah, and I definitely need to give Kapow another chance. I mean, I'm judging it on one play. And so yeah. that's not if that's not fair to Kapow either. So speaking of one play, um, I introduced Sean to the night cage, which was probably a bad idea because it was pretty late at night. I think it was like 2 a.m. at that point, And we probably should have called it before starting up. Um, I'm digging this one. This this one's neat. Um, it's interesting. It's co-op. It's got some neat mechanics. It was fiddly at first. There was some weird stuff going on with the with the rule book and like it's all there um but once we figured all that out and now flows really good and i'm enjoying it now that we're at that point but it did take a bit to get there uh it's a neat game i i think i'm gonna enjoy it for the right game nights i definitely know i'm gonna be bringing it out around the halloween time right in october and that i think it's gonna be a big hit and i have a feeling it's gonna be really big at public play events and it's gonna, probably gonna get more play at public play than with my family yeah it, it wasn't bad but I was tired and a couple of things just didn't quite make as much sense as they might have had it been earlier in the night. Uh, yeah. It's interesting, but as of now, anyway, I don't think it's something I would ever ask to play. I, I wouldn't, you yeah. know, wouldn't say no, thank you, but I probably would never ask to bring it out. Uh, then we're going to jump to the new year and one that I know people have been wanting to hear us talk about. So that's Lorcana, Disney Lorcana from Ravensburger. Now, I know I always talk about the, the, the first game you play in the new year sets the tone for the year, but I don't, I don't know what tone Lorcana sets. We're going to play more licensed games. I'm going to get back into collectible games. I don't know, whatever. Um, Deanna ended up getting me a copy of all of the existing starter sets for Christmas from one of our great friendly local game stores who didn't do any markup and managed to sell everything, you know, just at MSRP, which is always appreciated. Um, I first tried the game out versus Gwen. Um, then played again later against Sean. And then between then, Gwen and Dee played a game against each other. And then the other day, Sean played Gwen. So lots of Lorcana hitting my dining room table right now. Yeah. One thing I'll recommend if you're just picking up a starter and playing, make sure you read the suggestions on how your deck plays. Uh, every yeah. starter deck's rules are slightly different in that they give you a section on what your deck's concept is. Uh, maybe even take the time to do a quick flip through the deck so the cards are at least vaguely familiar uh, because going in completely blind 
because of certain mechanics that we're playing, uh, not the best idea. <laughs> yeah. Though I know every collectible card game player out there is scoffing at you going, no, you just pick up the deck and start playing. You can do that. And I but did. trust me, the decks play a lot better <laughs> if yeah. you try to use them the way they're intended, <laughs> if you're using them the way they were built. Yeah, I've, I've played it both ways now, and, and I would now know, now that I know, I, I wouldn't want to blindly uh, play a deck without at least skimming through and seeing what's in the deck. Yep. Now, I gotta say, the overall gameplay is uh, very similar to Magic, um, and we have played quite a few collectible card games. I'll admit, I haven't played many of the modern ones, but we've played quite a few. Um, and also very similar to Aventuria, a game we praise constantly on the show. One of one of my favorite deck builders of all time, um, or sorry, deck construction game. And I got to say that it's, it, that immediately won me over a bit because my favorite part of Aventuria is the endurance system and Arcana uses the exact same system. It's, it's identical. Your, your mana in this game is a pool of ink, which comes from your cards and each round you can turn one card into ink which is then used to play your other cards. That's identical to the endurance system in Aventuria. And one of the things we like the most about the game, and it works just as well here. Now, of course, the thing with this is when you use a card as ink, you never get it back. So that's what I like, is I like that hard decision of what to make into ink. Yeah, there are clearly cards that are in each starter that are throwaways basically intended for ink purposes. But if you're in a pinch, you might feel the need to put them into play which could lead you to needing to burn one of your heavy hitters as ink later yep. on. And one of the rules you're going to forget is watch for the fact you need a symbol to turn something into ink. Not every card can be turned into ink. That is different from Adventuria, but that, that is easy to fix. Every game I find, I got to double check my ink pile and see if I screwed it up. Now, highlights of the game include the goal of getting 20 lore, which is done by using your own cards, which is just, it's a friendlier theme. You're not attacking the other player and reducing their health. Instead, you're building up lore, which I thought was nice. That makes it a little less confrontational. Uh, that said, there is a combat system, though they call it challenging. You can challenge your characters, can challenge the other player's characters. Um, but the neat part here is I'm going to use the term tapped because I played Magic too long. You can only challenge characters that are tapped, and you have to tap to do it. And that, to me, is one of the biggest tactical parts of this game which is kind of neat because you're like, if you don't want your character attacked, just don't tap them. But then if you don't tap them, what purpose are they serving? And that decision of what to use your characters for to generate lore, to conf confront, or to use them to like sing or do something else is, is a big part of the game. Um, I'm sure at some point we'll do a full review and get into more detail. But I got to say the the game's solid and it's fun. Yeah, I definitely give this one a thumbs up. But thankfully, I'm past any interest into getting into the deck creation and competitive money pits that like this. Uh, but I would happily sit down and play a pre-made deck anytime. It, it, it that vibe I liked. Um, yeah. But the the efforts and 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 deck building, um, I'm I'm more too old for that now. <laughs> yeah, see, I can't decide. I I can't decide if I want to customize the decks or not. What I'm really tempted to do is just with the first three starter sets is like have everyone pick their own home deck in our family and give them the stuff. Because every one one bonus of this game, bonus or detriment, depending on how you look at it, is every starter comes with a random booster. First one's which free. Is, <laughs> does the nasty, here's your first taste. <laughs> so you do have that aspect of it, but it's cool that you get a little customization. Now, the problem is every booster has all six colors and every starter is only two colors. So only two, like, what, what would that be? Two sixths? Uh, so one third of that starter may be useful to you. One of that, excuse me, of that booster. And they weren't equally matched. And either. they're not. No, it's not like you get two cards from your, each color in every booster either, which I thought would have been a smart way to do it. But I'm not in charge of collectible card games. So, so what I'm tempted to do is just give the cards like here, here's your starter. I like to play the purple and yellow deck so far. You give me all the purple and yellow and maybe I'll do some substitutions. Now, what I can't decide is now that we have some of the Bloodborne, is that what the new second set is? I now have another deck with blue. And I'm like, if I mash those, then I ruin the, the straight out of the box feel. And and I'm I'm sure I can go online and rebuild them, but I can't I can't haven't decided what to do with my my booster pack cards. Well, if you keep the box, the box has the uh Yeah, they're one? already gone. <laughs> <laughs> uh next up. We're going to wrap up soon. We have a five player game of distilled uh, Sean's first full game. First time my youngest had played. 
she ended up loving it, which surprised me. Um, what I think really worked here well for her was that theme integration, that it just kind of spoke to her and worked for her special needs. It wasn't abstract to her. It was everything had a why. Why do you take the top and bottom? Well, because it's your wash and that's what you do. You know, like it, it just seemed to click in. Um, what she was doing made sense logically and mechanically, though. Basically, I just reiterating what we just said. So I don't have anything else to add that we haven't already said in the review. Yeah, no, it, it plays well. Great. Love it. Them thematic. Yep. Surprisingly good. I, I, I'd heard good things. Props to everyone who told us when you go to Origins, check out Distilled because I'm glad we did. Um, finally, Dan and I did grab some craft beer and sat down and had an impromptu stay home date night with some Cupid Crisis. Um, technically, we should have played the Groundhog Gambit first since the holiday comes sooner, but we knew what the theme for tonight's episode was, so I figured we'd throw this one in first. Now, one thing I didn't mention in the review, and only, well, I kind of hinted at it, was the fact it featured a one-person story, and I just thought that was weird. Like, like it's it, it's it's Valentine's Day. Like, it's going to be a date night game, right? Like, aren't you marketing this as a date night? Like, why would they write a one-person perspective story for what should be a two-player game? Like, I don't know. They could have done something like this could have easily been two player where one person gets one pack of cards. The other gets a different stack. Or after entering the first clue, you are presented with multiple puzzles. If it just said one of you take these cards, the other of you take those other cards. You'd still be able to work together, but each get your own part of the story. And and honestly, you could have done it with the existing story and puzzles that were in this one. I just felt odd doing a date night game about one person stuck in a restaurant. Yeah, it's interesting because, again, we we associate valentine's day with with dating and and going out and together but there's nothing about the game that says it's a date night game there's not it's it's, it's not a the game doesn't say you know couples game uh that's, not that's, on the package yeah so if you go on grand gamers guild and read the description it says you show up to date night at the restaurant so well yeah you show up to date night not you, you like it's it, it, it doesn't there's no there's no indication of couples involved now, as for the coming weeks, um, there's a new miniature-focused board game event happening this Sunday at the Walkerville Brewery. I may attend that. I may not. We'll see. I'm hoping to get some birthday beers and games in this weekend, and I probably should do some more unboxings, but nothing's set in stone. Um, really, at this point, we're doing play play by ear. Well, before we start locking things down, let's take a moment to thank a selection of our tabletop bellhop Patreon patrons. Their support helps keep this show going. Roger Malosh, thank you. David Miller Jr., even in the chat to get called out this week. Nice. Thank you. Brian Kurtz, thank you. Jeff and Sheila Seuss, thank you. Kator, thank you. Although, do we need to change the name now? Because there's... Or does the, the... I haven't gamed with Clark yet, so maybe we got a, a Kator and C. I, I don't know. Kator. Kator? That, that sounds weird. <laughs> Kator. Maybe we do. Well, that was the double bell. That means our shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock the lobby doors. When the doors are closed. You can always find us at tabletopbellhop.com. All over the web is Tabletop Bellhop, one word, and on your podcatcher of choice as the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast. So did we do a good job tonight? Did you learn something new about a game you didn't know before? Have we given you ideas for your next date night? Say thanks by tipping your bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. Well, that's all for us tonight. Another way you can show your support is by giving us a thumbs up, a like, leave a comment, or better yet, tell your friends and fellow gamers about our show. For the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.